I really truly see myself as an operator. You know, I, I, I really, I will never not run a business. At scale, by the way. I'll never, I will, I, and this is a fun thing to say in this room, I'll never be Gary Vee full time. Like, it's super fun to be number two. Like, I always bust AJ's chops, I'm like, you got the fucking gig. Because like, it, when the whole thing's on fire, like you still can go, what are we gonna do? Like, <laughs> As scary as it is for you to judge me and for you to not think I'm cool and this and that, what's way scarier, the thing I, I think one of the scariest things in the world is regret. You know why? You can't fix it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode four of the Community Made Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaynard. In our last episode, we wrapped up my solo portion of season one, where I talked about the eight steps and strategies for designing a calendar that aligns with how you truly want to be living your life, because ultimately, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. In today's episode, I'm sharing a really special Q&A that Gary Vaynerchuk did at MMT. And I say special because Gary released this to his community recently, and the feedback has been absolutely phenomenal. Ramul said, the best keynote I've seen from Gary. Jake Van Ness said, I have to agree with some of the other commenters that this was a really special Q&A. It felt like he was just hanging out with friends and talked a lot more casually than when he's on a big stage. George said, This was by far the most engaging Q&A that I've seen Gary give. I watched all of his content on YouTube. I saw a side of him that was very sincere. Now, the reason I believe Gary was so well received is because he knew and was friends with probably a third of the people in the room that night. That created a really special vibe where he went deeper than he ever did before. In this episode, Gary talks frankly about running VaynerMedia, choosing the right leadership team, and surrounding himself with a special task force that he likes to call the office of the CEO. He opens up about parenting, the power of nostalgia, and predicts major trends in what he believes will become the next big retail boom. If you don't know who Gary is, he's a New York Times bestselling author and has written many books such as Crush It, The Thank You Economy, and Ask Gary V. He's widely recognized as a thought leader and industry expert when it comes to marketing, social media, and business strategy. He's a very successful early stage investor with many unicorns in his portfolio, including Uber, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. He's a big, no BS influencer in business with millions of followers and definitely someone you wanna dig into if you haven't already. One last thing before I go, I decided to include this episode in the season, in season one specifically, because you'll notice that Gary and I sit on very opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to scaling your business. The one thing I I hate about folks in the quote unquote expert space is that they only give you their one side. They speak in absolutes in essence. Like if that's the only way to approach life or to approach business. And I wanna expose you to other ways of thinking, other viewpoints. And I made my case in episode two with the, the episode scaling is stupid. Now I wanna expose you to someone who has a completely opposite view. Someone who has, was at 650 employees at the time of this recording and is on track to, to be at 1,000 employees by the end of the year. Now, if you're a member of the Community Made group, i love to hear your thoughts on scale. Now, another thing to note is that for the sake of time, we've edited this video down a bit for you. So if you wanna get access to the unedited original video, you can get access by going to the Community Made group. If you're not a member, I've said it before and I'll say it again, it is free. Simply visit communitymade.com to join. So ladies and gentlemen, that's it. Enjoy episode four with Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, obviously whether it's entrepreneurship or investing or running a company, I I think for the people here that have had the time, because I know so many of you are so busy, in the last six months to a year, I've been spending a lot more time on what really has allowed me the privilege of standing in front of you, which is I'm not really IQ strong. I'm really probably, I, I would actually argue that I'm probably below average to average on IQ, but I do think my parents blessed me with over the top EQ and my emotional intelligence and, and self-awareness and empathy and the way I built my, you know, the reason VaynerMedia has gone from 30 to 650 people and hasn't broke is predicated so much on EQ and then 
consumer behavior, like projecting what I think you guys are gonna do before you realize you're gonna do it, has a little bit to do with that stuff as well. So, um, thrilled to go anywhere. I'm really excited to do Q and A, and thanks for having me. So, are you guys gonna mic it? You're gonna run it, Corey? Let's let's just get into it. Cameron Harold, I've got a question regarding second in command. I ran a session today about your chief operating officer. I want to know who's running VaynerMedia for you and what makes the relationship between you and that person so strong. So that's an interesting question and an interesting time to ask that question. This Friday, my brother AJ, who's been the COO of VaynerMedia from the beginning, is leaving the company. I think some of you might have read about a month ago, AJ finally announced, because he's been very private about it, my brother has Crohn's disease um, and you know, truth is, and, and I know some of you know AJ, AJ and I are really different, you know, just like, you know, I'm much more, um, I mean, AJ's thrilled to have his seven friends and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm desperate to like be deep friends with every fucking person in here. Um, and so we're, you know, uh, so AJ was no question, you know, the COO of the company uh, for the first five or six years. Over the last year and a half, we knew this was coming, so we commoditized him out. Um, there's a guy by the name of James Orsini who ran, you know, for 25 years, ran big agencies, Saatchi and Saatchi and things of that nature. Um, you know, the truth is, and something I've been talking a lot about with my own friends, not as much publicly, um, maybe John, uh, very few people know this in this room, maybe one or two. My, I'm a, I really run VaynerMedia. Like, I'm, like I think because I play Gary V as my side hustle, um, and, and because I'm good at it, and because I work 18 hours a day, a far majority in this room, including people like Dan, like people like Yannick, like people that I really know, I don't think really understand how much I actually operate the business. And so, um, for me, I, I, every operational decision runs through me. I've, I've got a lot of context on it, I'm there. Um, and I think, I think the key, and I'd be curious, and we can maybe talk afterwards, I think the key for me in having a number two or a number three is less about them running it in the way that you framed it. It's more about them complimenting the things that you're not good at. Like I'm very self-aware, right? Like for example, the, like knowing that 20% of you, a lot of you don't know me, but I know knowing the ones that know me, knowing that 20% of you didn't even like me on first impression at a conference or things of that nature. Like self-awareness is imperative and as an operator, I'm very self-aware and I know what my shortcomings are. Um, And so I think for anybody here that's looking to scale, um, I think there's way too much pride uh, in this collective room. Like nobody here is good at everything and that's super real and I think we all know that. And we have strengths and weaknesses and I think I've been a guy and I've watched a lot of companies do this at scale I really believe on tripling down on your strengths. I do not, I'm not a big fan on working on your weaknesses. I think you have to be dangerous in your weaknesses. Like, I'm not a dope when it comes to the finances or the other things that I don't wanna do, but I'm far from being interested in being world class in it. It just doesn't leave enough room for you to be world class at what comes natural to you, which is always gonna have more upside. So, so it's been AJ, it's gonna be James. I'm building something else, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of you that have bigger organizations, if you're not in a solo entrepreneur land and if you run companies, one of the things that I realized and I realized I did at Wine Library and I'm gonna make it official at VaynerMedia is I'm gonna create something called Office of the CEO. So there's gonna be these six people and they're my family. They're the inner circle. They're the people that nobody else in the company tells anything to because they know the second they tell them they're gonna tell me. Right, They're, you know, everybody's got that inner circle, and they, and by the way, some of them are ranked number five in the company, and another person might be number one seventy four salary level. So now I'm going to make it official because they just help me scale. When there's that level of trust, I think sometimes people silo a level of trust just to your right hand right, woman, right hand man, like one or two people. I actually am looking for scale, and so I'm going to build a five six person team that basically is just gonna take care of the thing that's the most important to me right now. Like we're, we're, we just landed one of the biggest banks in the country, I can't even announce it yet. One of the biggest banks in the country, it's gonna be 30% of our revenue. It's an enormously big client. I really need to make sure it goes well. I need to put everything on it besides the great team I put on it. So they'll keep an eye on that. And then they'll keep an eye on this one employee that I think is a superstar and they're gonna vet it. And you know, so um, the other thing I would give a recommendation to that has I think thematics into where you're going is, uh, 
building an inner circle that everybody in the company knows is you. Just like even the five people within the organization won't in that group won't even have a title within it. It's just gonna be, that's what they are, office of the CEO. And so something to consider that I see a lot of value in. Hey Gary, my name is Zach Obrant. Uh, hey, the question is, I've heard you mention before that you think of VaynerMedia as like 650 people to leverage you. Yes, um, the scalable version of my yeah, marketing so, so talent. So what's, yeah. what's the thinking both from a why perspective and a how perspective of doing that versus the more typical agency model of trying to remove yourself or make it more self-sufficient without you? Well, it is self-sufficient without me. And why don't you hold the mic because there might be a detail here. Yeah. It's fully self-sufficient without me. Okay. I think, again, in the same way as your first question, again, this is, I always think the paradox of how I run shit and like what I'm excited about to keep you interested for 10, 20, 30 years, like most of what it looks like is going on isn't. Like, I think you'd be very fascinated by the fact that, I don't know, of the $100 million in revenue VaynerMedia will do this year, 60 or 70 of it almost has nothing. Like, I, I don't even know the client, like nothing. Like, they're not buying Gary Vaynerchuk. They all, like, they, of course, once in a while they may think that, but we're very clear that this is an agency. Um, so it's very self-sufficient without me. Um, but why it's the scalable version of me is the craft that the agency is doing. Meaning, we're leaving a ton of fucking money on the table by not doing banner ads, by not doing search, by not doing a ton of shit. We probably left $25 million straight up on the table by not wanting to build websites. So when I say it's a scalable version of me, my main plan seven years ago was, how am I gonna buy the, as I started meeting Zucks and Travis and Zuck, I was like, fuck, I'm not these guys. I'm just, I'm, this is not who I am. And back to self-awareness, I'm like, so I'm not gonna make my money the way they're gonna make their money. So seven years ago, I'm like, how am I gonna buy the Jets? Right, and so, <laughs> and so, um, and so I decided that what I was better at than all of them was I could sell shit better than them and like stuff. And then I kind of gave it a lot of thought for a year and I said, huh. There was this guy by the name of Dean Metropolis. He's just a private equity guy, but he did something I believe in. I'm a very big believer that nostalgia is the most underpriced asset in our society. It's, for example, had I been further along, and I wouldn't have seen it, but had I been further along, it would have made sense for me to buy Marvel in bankruptcy and then make it into movies and make a trillion dollars. That makes sense to me because the Hulk has been around for a while. Like Spider-Man matters. So Dean Metropolis bought tuna under the sea tuna fish. He bought Paps Blue Ribbon beer. He bought Bazooka Joe gum. And then he just built, runs them better and flips them. For me, I want to buy brands like Snickers or Puma or Lacoste or I don't know, Timex like I, or Peter Pan peanut butter. I want to buy brands that have been neglected and underpriced, run them through the VaynerMedia machine and then flip them because those are the kind of things you can, like I can buy a business for $80 million and sell it for 4.6 billion if I can do what I've done in two businesses that I've ever run which is grow revenue extraordinarily quick. So. That's what I set out to do, which meant I was gonna have to eat shit for 10 years at the height. And again, Dan, a couple of people here, you guys knew me, like I had a lot of leverage in 2007, eight, nine, 10, like I was in it, I was in it. And when I announced VaynerMedia, Zucks texted me and said, the fuck are you doing? Like building an agency, client services? Like I was a disappointment to all my tech titan friends. I mean it, like, like straight up disappointment. But. But I was like, cool, like, you go do you and make trillions and change the world. <laughs> I just need to make four billion and buy the Jets. And so this is the only way I know how to do it. And so it took a lot of humility and patience to get here seven years later and have what I have. It also took the fact that I had to know that my people skills were much better than everybody else's so that I'd be able to keep, because my vulnerability is they can leave tomorrow. I'm not building a product, I'm not in the SaaS business. Like, but I also had enormous confidence in my ability on a people level, and so that's where we're at. And so that's what I mean by that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Hey, I'm, hey. Uh, I'm bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Snapchat. <laughs> um, on page seven of your book, which I've owned for about 10 minutes now. Yes. It rocks. 
you talk about how one of the biggest lessons that you learned in 2015 was that you had to start taking better care of yourself. Yes, health-wise. And I'm, I'm curious to get a little bit more of the, the nitty-gritty details about that. Like, what did you do as a busy family man, entrepreneur, to start taking care of yourself? Uh, well, John, why don't you come up here and why don't we tell this story together? I was hoping you'd say that. You got it. Yeah, let's get a mic for this man. This man has a lot to do with it. Let's clap it up for this guy. Hey guys. So, this is very exciting. I'll let him take over at some point because he'll know where to take over. I'll give you the context. Basically, um, super fucking random, like just random fucking flight from San Francisco to New York. I'm just sitting there and I'm like, you know, when, when am I going to take care of this health thing? Like, I know that it's not right, I know I'm not winning. I know that, you know, I, I got into a good place in my head around my health where I looked at it like a business. And I said, I'm not doing the behavior that's gonna make me successful. And eventually this is gonna catch up. And the weird thing is, it got to a place where I was like, wow, I don't do anything right. I eat like shit. I've never worked out once in my life. And somehow I can literally work 18 hours a day and not be tired. And my fat is equally proportioned through my entire body, so it's hiding <laughs> how fat I, and, and like inside I must be a fuck, I mean I'm fucking Yokozuna from WWF, but it's not like, you know, and so I just started talking to myself, I talked to myself a lot, and I was like, you know, I need to address this. So that's what I said, and then the flight's delayed. Super funny, it happens, no big deal. And I'm just talking and talking, and I was like, you know what, when I turned 30, I freaked my shit with Wine Library and I started Wine Library TV and like got into tech and like completely changed my behavior on my 30th birthday. Driving to Wine Library, looking in my rear view mirror, I'm like, literally, this is what happened. My birthday, my 30th birthday, I looked myself dead in the mirror in my drive, in my rear view mirror and I said, you're fucking full of shit. And what I was saying to myself, talking to myself, I was like, you say that you're gonna buy the New York Jets? None of your behavior maps you pulling that off. And so if you're gonna do it, you better do it. You better lay down some serious foundation from 30 to 40 because family's coming and all this, right? So I said to myself, wouldn't it be romantic if on my 40th birthday, because I don't think I need another, what am I gonna work? From 19 hours a day to 24? Like, I was like, you know, that's not gonna be it. I was like, you know what, health. That'd be a really good one to address. Let me get my shit together there. And literally before the flight took over, I said, because this I was 38 and four months old, I was like, fuck it, I'll just, why wait to 40? I'll do it at 39, <laughs> right? And, and then literally I was like, you know what? Fuck it, I'll do it as soon as possible. And so that happened about a year and a half after we met where I, tried my first version yeah. of what I just told you, which was I decided to go the peer pressure route and I publicly tweeted and Facebooked that I wanted to get a trainer. That's when you took over. Yeah, so we, um, this is 2011, I think. Mm -hmm. um, 12, so, maybe 12. Uh, it, was, it was right when 11, uh, Thank You Economy came out. Okay, right? Yeah, 11. so 2011-ish. And Gary and I met, he was giving a talk at uh, the Apple Store in Soho. I went down in my jet skier. Um, which is not just like me blowing Gary, I'm just a big fucking Jets fan to my everlasting dismay. And um, so we met, we chat a little bit, um, just, you know, rapport, building relationships, and um, as most people do inappropriately, he commented on my physique, turned out I was a trainer, gave him my card, which he then lost. A couple of weeks later. I threw it out. But yeah, fuck this. Is, yeah, because like, at that point, I was like, 2011, John, I was like, oh, fucking, I'm super professional business cards. I should have just fucking tweeted at him. But, um, and then, yeah, he put up on Facebook that he needed a, a trainer. And um, so people did what is inexplicable to me, people who follow Gary, instead of like leveraging what they do, they all just jumped on that Facebook thread, pick me, pick me, pick me. And, you know, the shit that Gary talks about not doing. And so I was like, fuck that. And I just posted on my Facebook and sent like everyone on my page over to blow up his thread. And so like then I got an email like maybe 20 minutes later from Phil Toronto who uh, was, the, was then Gary's assistant. And like that Monday we're, I was in the gym with Gary. So the plan initially was to train four to five days a week for an hour and then Gary made it a habit of canceling on me at least three times a week. And, uh, and I let him off the hook. It was just like, it was really cool to be working with Gary. But we did a lot of work together. And uh, then... 
that story, I'll jump in. Yeah. So that's right, because by the way, and I talk a lot about it in business, I know for the, some of you that are following along, I talk about religion over tactics. Like, I just wasn't in the religious place to take care of my, my health with him. I was half pregnant. I was like, you know, that's why I canceled. I mean, the, I, I'm publicly saying I never get sick. He's supposed to work out with me at 6.30. At 6.22, I'm like, dude, I'm so sick. Yeah, I was like, you know? motherfucker. I was so, like already in a, I was like in a West Village at the time, going to the Upper East Side, like a $40 cab, but it's like, this motherfucker. But we, it's, like, we, it's cool, bro. We, we built a really nice yeah. relationship, and when and I made then, that decision, the first thing I did was call him, Right. So and he, I said, I need your help, yeah. and what my plan was, was what I realized, by the way, in that moment, was I was not held accountable to myself. Right. And so he called me and he said, I have this crazy idea, tell me if it's retarded. What I would like to do is hire someone to be completely in charge of my body. I wanna bring them on full time as a as staff and they want, they're gonna be in charge of my food, they're gonna travel with me, take care of my workouts and everything. And I said, I think it's a great idea if you don't fucking cancel on them all the time. <laughs> and, uh, but you also, you have to find someone who's good. You know, you, you gotta like, someone who sits in the Venn diagram of being good enough for me to feel comfortable recommending them to get, I, I had lived, I had moved to LA at this point. I was no longer eligible for this job. Um, and they have to be good enough. They have to like be at a point in their business where it makes sense to only have one client. It, it needs to make sense in all these different facets. And so the only guy I could think of was a, a kid who had started as an intern for me, became my protege and then started his own business, Mike Vacanti. And so Gary had trained with him briefly um, and then that was even can't, worse. And he was, yeah, he four like, months, like, like four months, he did like three sessions. <laughs> and so I was like, Michael, kill it for you. Um, he, he really is, he's a great trainer and a phenomenal dude. And I knew that he had the right, he had the right metal to be able to work with Gary and travel with him 300 days out of the year at points. And, um, and so that's how it started. And so Gary, uh, Mike became the, the CEO of Gary's body. And since then, Gary has, has made tremendous physical changes and it's also given him a lot more energy. And that's more or less the genesis has not, of that. Has not given me more energy. I'm, I'm just no. fully, <laughs> fully like, wanna, like, has not. Now. He's, le he's, now. Less, he's no, less broken than he no, was. No, I mean, look, look. I mean, do I expect a 57 or seven? Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not naive that there's so much good that's supposed to happen, but like, I never want to say things that haven't happened. I don't have more energy. What I do have is, at least my left glute is now active. That's so true. Th <laughs> was not active That is something I have now. Who knew that a glute could go so inactive? Yeah. So go sit down, that's I got more to do. There you go, man. Thanks, good to see you. Good luck, buddy. So, it was, the answer is, it all, and this is how I believe about every business. Like, I talk a lot about fitness entrepreneurs who are so good about their physique and their regimen and all that, but then in their business, they're looking for the secret or the 12 courses that don't let them do the work. Once I made the religious decision to do the work and I had one interesting unlock that maybe can help you in some way, I figured out in that really zen place, I was like, fuck, it's because I'm not competitive with myself. I don't give a shit if I run four minutes and nine seconds and yesterday I did 4.11. Like, I'm competitive with everything in the world but myself. And so I realized I needed to be held accountable to another human. I work out every single day and don't cheat. and do, Like, I've been unbelievable because I don't want to let Mike down. And because I know every morning I'm gonna sit, go on the scale and Mike's gonna know. Like there's, I've suffocated myself. And now it's, and by the way, uh, Mike's, Mike's tenure of two years all in is done July 7th. I have a new guy starting and for three years. And, um, and I'm, tell, I'm, I'm very comfortable saying this. If I was ever to stop doing it, I would re revert back. So many people after six months or a year like, all right, Gary, like, you don't need Mike anymore. Like, you got it now. I'm like, absolutely not. It's the accountability to another person is what was the breakthrough for me. Hey, I'm Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof Coffee Guy. Hey, man. Hey. You mentioned earlier when you were hiring a personal trainer, CEO of your health, pick me, pick me, pick me, all over the place, right? I'm dealing with the same things. What do you do to prevent the people from coming into your circle who are there as basically brand parasites? They want to be there for three months or six months, say, hey, I work for Gary Vee, right. and then go out and build their own brand and probably steal half your shit. Like, how, how do you get around that? So, first of all, I get around it by not being crippled by it. So, I'm just not worried about it. Like, it's, it's a cost of entry, and it's a byproduct, and actually, I look, I'm actually flattered by it to be very frank with you. So mentally, that's where I'm at. Number two, I'm never worried about stealing. Like, it's interesting that you brought that up. I try to give away all my shit all the time. Like, to me, 
one thing I've learned is that 99% of people won't do anything with your information anyway. It's, it's all execution and especially what I do for a living, I'm trying to figure out new platforms of attention quicker and better than the market. So, I mean, by, my, by the way, pre-roll YouTube video. There's nine years of content of me saying it's shit except six months ago, Google changed it and now you can target people's Google search behavior in pre-roll video and all of a sudden it's fucking good because I know exactly what your intent is. I don't give a crap about Google's bullshit demographics. No longer am I crippled by are you really a 33 year old African American female in Houston? I don't give a shit. I know that you searched the Houston Rockets. So I got what I need, right? Um, So, you know, the truth is I, I've got it in a mental box where like I understand. The one that's probably bothered me the most is jab, 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 right hook. So I wrote a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook. Give, 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 and then ask. Unfortunately, so many think it's give, 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 and then take. Even more scary, I don't like when I watch people give me things I don't want and then expect me to give them things and then be like, what up bro, jab, 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 right hook. I'm like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> Like, like, I didn't want you to send me your bullshit t-shirt. Like, I, I don't consider your fucking piece of shit t-shirt a jab, dick face. So, so, got it? So, I would say look, and I think more importantly, I'll give you one other slight tweak that I actually think is more helpful than anything I've said here, and this will help a lot of you, I hope, because it's been huge for me. It's never the hiring. Too many people here are crippled by hiring and making the right call. It's about the firing. So so if you're gonna let somebody into your inner circle, don't worry about what their intentions are or if they're full of shit. Once they get in, if you can taste it, get them out. Got it? You You got it, brother. Hey Gary, my name's Dev, I'm a search guy. Awesome. And I wanted to ask, what are some of the keys to new business growth at VaynerMedia? You guys like scaled immensely fast um, over the years, up to 100 mil, right? So what were some of the keys that basically led to that growth in new business? Um, the pillars that got us there were number one, culture internally. Because I think, so I'm a big fan of B and C players. I'm gonna give you a lot of things, like the hiring and the firing. Another one that I think has that same ethos is I'm actually very fond of average players on your team. If you're going for scale, if you're gonna build a four person company, you all have to be ninjas, I get it. But if you're, but if you're, if you're building a 700 person company, you don't have 700 A's. As a matter of fact, if you really break it down, anybody that works for somebody else isn't like you. There was no me working for you. So, so number one, it was the acceptance of not being crippled. First, hiring ultra fat, ugh. The hiring process at VaynerMedia is, are you alive? You're hired. <laughs> like, like, the inside, like the truth is it got a little bit better than that when I got out of the equation, but when I hired employee 30 to a buck 50, people barely got off the elevator and I was like, here's your punch card. You know, like, like people were like, especially people that, a lot of the early people like knew who I was and they thought it might be hard. I mean, they couldn't believe, I was like, you like sports? Nah, you're hired. <laughs> like, it was just like, it was just whatever because I, I realized we were growing. And, and here's something very interesting. One thing that you have to understand is you can't be the judge and the jury for the market. One of the reasons I grew it so fast was we were so ahead of the market with social media marketing and strategy that even if they were B and C players, I knew they were A players to the market. So my B and C could walk into Campbell's soup and seem like a super A. So I think one of the things that, if you're great at search, what you need to understand is who you're selling to may not be as great as you are, and not the, and and please, I wanna make sure I'm being very, this is what's great about having time to give these detailed answers. I'm not talking about selling stuff you don't believe in. You gotta understand, a lot of people, so I had, you know what's funny? I had a lot of no men and no women around me. Like for somebody who's so hyperbolized, I like people who like push back against me. I need the context. So a lot of them pushed very hard in 2010 and 11 of like, Gary, what's the ROI? Like right in my team, like does this mean anything? Is this, does this help the client? And I educate them like look, we, and this was before there was paid social that could drive the business results we have now, so it was very organic. I go look, here's what you have to understand. They're paying us 
$1,000 a month for the amount of content and strategy we're giving them and just the IP for $60,000 a year is a gift for these companies, they're paying, they're paying $5,000 right now for the catering bill on their bullshit commercial, right? So it's about contextualizing. Um, and so one, it was the culture, like keep continuity. The amount of people I have, our, tur- our voluntary turnover rate is 75 to 100, like it's unbelievably better than the market. Um, two, it was my brand leadership as a, you know, I mean I had a real, fu- I, I, what do you mean I had? I have a real fucking racket. I get paid $100,000 to go and speak and then land million dollar accounts. It's fucking good, you know? Like, <laughs> like so, you know what I mean? Like, like, it was funny, I saw you shaking your head to some stuff right now. I always pay attention to who's vibing with me when I speak and I use their positive energy to keep my momentum going. Um, this one Toyota talk, small group, maybe this size, and there's just one guy giving me vibes like, like, my, like you know, mentally I'm like, I'm gonna go thank that guy after this talk. Guy ends up being the fucking CMO of Toyota. And this was a dealership, like Northeast dealers, you know? <laughs> like, and so, um, this speaking, my brand, um, and then finally, and this will always be tried and true, as charismatic and as cool as I am, as much as we have continuity, there is no $100 million, there's no 30 to 650 people, three to 100 million in revenue in four years without doing good work. So the biggest growth we had, the biggest, was somebody at Pepsi being blown up. Lipton brisk iced tea, South by Southwest 2009, 10, 2009, seven weeks after Instagram came out, we made Instagram cans for brisk iced tea for South by Southwest that got them a lot of press as Instagram blew up. That guy left and went to Mondelez and hired us, right? So like in corporate America, people are leaving and going to different companies and hiring us. The key to our growth was word of mouth of our good work when people went to other companies. Yeah. Hey, man. Hey, man. Uh, family question for you. I'm not sure, sure if uh, Mark has asked you this at the social media market, marketing world or not. Um, but uh, I know you're really good about keeping weekends to yourself. Yes. <clears throat> Four or five years from now, your kid says, hey, Dad, you're not around as much as I'd like you to be. I'm super scared of this conversation, by the way. Yeah. I'm being dead serious. I am too. I mean, our I'm, kids are I'm, the same age. And, like, keep going. What, you know, does it change, does it change the I don't plans know. by the Jets? Does I, it... uh, one thing, I was, I was super excited about being here because when I get to do long Q&A with a lot of people that have some sense of who I am and there's a high caliber of individuals, A, I'm never interested in bullshitting. You know, B, I think I'm even at a heightened degree of not wanting to bullshit, um, if that makes any sense. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Like... I am not interested in lying about this issue. One of the things that I think some of you have noticed is I'm starting to talk about suicide and depression in entrepreneur land because it's real. A, a lot of, most, especially looking at this room, at the age group that a lot of us are in this room, there's less fake entrepreneurs here than when I go to the Y Combinator event in a couple months. Like, it has become such a popular thing to sell. There are so many 22, 23, 24 year olds that are truly not entrepreneurs, that are being entrepreneurs because it's the cool thing to do. And what it's leading to, and, and the cliche, and this is of course generalization, but the thing that I've seen, because I'm very in it right now, is a lot of the 24 year olds that are in entrepreneurship are the people that can raise you know, $3 million or a million dollars to do it. And a lot of those people are rich white dudes. Okay, and the cliche thing with a lot of these rich white kids that are 22, 23, 24 starting these internet companies is they grew up in a private school, they went to a big time college, mom and dad facilitated a lot, and the first time they've ever dealt with any true meritocracy or market conditions is the day their app hits the market and the market says go fuck yourself almost every time. (laughs) And it's this stuff, you know, we, we have and a lot of you are parents, or are gonna be parents, we have an absolute wrong game right now in our culture in America. And by the way, this happens to every empire. This is what's happening to us. It's black and white. We are in the eighth place trophy business right now. We just are. We're rewarding kids because we think we're doing fake self-esteem. It's the politically correct thing to do. And my wife knows I don't give a fuck about anything when it comes to 
what the kids are doing in school, but when they go and do camp or sport, like no eighth place trophies. Like my little guy Xander, he's got a little basket in our apartment. He has never made a single basket on me, nor will he until he's 15 or 16 years old. <laughs> I'm being dead serious. Because, because it's not life. It's just not life. And so, <laughs> it's true, it's true. He will never score. He's got a weird complex already about it. And, uh, and, uh, and so, I think that, um, I think that, uh, I, think, I think we're living through a very interesting time right now of depression and suicide. There's been three suicides in the tech ecosystem, the hardcore tech ecosystem that we know and nobody talks about it. And we need to talk about it and there's a lack of self-awareness right now in the game um, and, um, and I'm worried about it. And I forgot about the question because I was wrapping that back to something. What was it again? Oh, if they say, so on that, on that, I think, it's, I think you've gotta talk real truths and so I don't wanna bullshit. Like if my kids say that, I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna tell them. I know, that, I know that I was a lot more scared of it a year or two ago until I realized that, <laughs> this is just so fucking real, oh, I'm getting to a wealth level where I'm being able to grab my kids from school on Friday and fly private somewhere for three days with them and fly, like, I, I actually am so curious if I'm gonna get caught in the middle. I do believe, and I've watched very carefully, that there's a financial arbitrage level where you can buy time at such an incredible pace that you might be able to sell it back to that time together. No one thing. I haven't missed a recital or an important school event for my first grade daughter yet. You know, if I'm in New York, which means, and I'm, luckily I'm not traveling 300 days a week, like I've missed stuff, but I'll never miss it if it's controllable. And the other thing I'm very fascinated by is a lot of my friends spend time with their kids, but they're not spending time with their kids. So like, a lot of my buddies are absolutely like, will razz me, and then I'll razz them back and be like, dude, I was over your house the other day, like, you're not with your, you, you play Call of Duty when you get home from work. <laughs> like, you're not with your kids, so, I mean, and, and listen, I'm gonna say another thing. There's a couple things that I'm absolutely adamant about. I will never give you I will never judge, forget about give you. I think we all like to spew a little advice. Um, I will never, I will never judge somebody's relationship or how they parent. I'm the byproduct of immigrant parents where I didn't even see my dad until I was 15 years old and he's my best bud. We have the greatest relationship of all time. So of course I'm affected by that, right? Of course I'm affected by, shit, my dad got away with, not, and, but I'm also not taking for granted that my kids are wired the same way that I was. I think it's an always moving thing. Um, so I don't know, man, I don't know. I don't know what I'm gonna do. But I really, I just know my truth, which is if I'm not happy, then everything else breaks. And if it makes me unhappy not to hustle and do my thing, that's a vulnerability. And that's a real truth that people don't want to say out loud, which is, you know, I know what the politically correct thing to say here is. I know what everybody wants to say, but I'm suffocated not being me. I'm suffocated not being me. And my kids are way worse off if I'm unhappy than being happy. And so I don't want to let them down. Um, I'm pretty, I'm already, t I'm, listen, I'm taking seven weeks vacation a year. It's, and it's hardcore quality time in that seven weeks. And then with weekends, I actually weirdly think I need to work more. I'm like, fuck, there's two days a week. You know, like, like I don't know, like, it's, um, I'm concerned about it because I don't know my kids well enough yet, right? I don't know where they're, like, I know the way Lizzie and I are building them and I'm hoping with the DNA that they have that they're gonna be extremely self-confident and self-worth and a lot of those kind of things that, that will keep them into a place where that won't be as much of an issue or concern or their, their worth won't be wrapped up in um, my behavior. And I mean that. Like one of the things that my wife and I share and it's probably the foundation of our love affair with each other is we don't fucking give a fuck about what anybody thinks including each other think about each other. <laughs> my I came home the other day, I was like, Liz, you have to tell me about your side, dude, because 
you really don't give a fuck. Like, if I texted Lizzie right now, I was like, hey, uh, ran into Jordan and Dan and John at this event, and we're gonna go to Korea for uh, nine months to work on this new startup, she would literally text back in like two minutes and be like, do you want me to pack? Like it's unbelievable to me how much she is an enabler of my behavior. Um, <laughs> I mean it, I mean it. And, uh, and she does her thing and, and, and so I don't know, I don't know and it's the most interesting variable in my life but I'm convinced that I will never go as far as the market wants me to because I know myself too well and I just won't be happy if I can't do me. Hey Gary, Alex, Alex Icon on Snapchat. Thanks for selling me on Snapchat. You got it, brother. Um, yeah, the question I want to ask you, you talked earlier about leveraging Vayner into buying businesses. Yes. So when are you going to go all in on that? And what are the businesses you're going to start with? I don't know. Um, I don't know what businesses I'm going to start with. I've been looking at deals for the last 18 months. I even got into one letter of intent, but I didn't like the way the numbers looked. I'd love to, so first of all, number one rule is it had to be big at one point and it's not right now, right? So, uh, Bubblicious Bubblegum did 128 million in revenue a couple, uh, you know, 13 years ago, 17 years ago, now it does seven, right? So like, there's a lot of things like that, like Green Giant food sold not too long ago, you know, like, just think, uh, Fila. Remember Fila? You know, like, and for all you hip hop heads and Grand Hill fans, like, it was big for 48 seconds, right? Like, Z Cavarici pants, <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, like, so like, it had to have brand for a certain time. Um, by the way, this is how the toy business works. Like, my little, po- like, go, like, for anybody who's 40, like I am, or in that general range, if you go into toy on now, it's our toy aisle because we're parents now and we'll be nostalgic and we want our kids to play with Strawberry Shortcake and G.I. Joe and Star Wars and My Little Pony and da 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 da. So um, it has to be underpriced, had to have a lot of revenue and my preference would be that it would skew very strong 13 to 30 because my marketing behavior usually starts there and it's underpriced there so what I, any brand that you want to sell to, if you want to sell something to an 18 year old in America today, and you don't spend 90% of your money and energy on Snapchat and Instagram, you're an idiot. That's where their attention is. And that stuff is always underpriced. Snapchat and Instagram influencers and Snapchat marketing are underpriced, grossly underpriced right now. The way search was grossly underpriced when I started doing it in 2001, and and there's long, like long tail search SEMs that are underpriced, but the word wine is not five cents a click anymore. And Facebook advertising 24 months ago was the greatest steal in the market when I was yelling about it and everybody was like, no, they took away our, everybody got romantic. They took away our organic reach. Who gives a fuck? They took away your organic reach and they gave you the best ad product that ever existed, you know, in return and so, and it's the same thing right now. You're debating Snapchat, it's a fad, da 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 And then in 24 months, you're gonna be on it and you're gonna not land grab as much. It's gonna be harder to build the fan base. It's gonna get noisy. The early users are gonna stop buying from it. Like, it's just the same fucking pattern recognition forever. <laughs> you got it. Hey, Gary Cole. Cole. What's up, man? What's up? Quick first question for your fund, the 50 to 70 million. Yeah. Is it open to outside investors and what's the maximum offer or buy-in? So yeah, I'm st- we still haven't closed. The minimum is a $2 million check and super happy to talk to you about it. Perfect, thank you. Bigger, oh sorry, that was just real quick. Uh, bigger question, um, was talking to Yannick today yes. and uh, you know about Thrive where you spoke. What do you think about someone who's in a startup including a social element or a give like a Tom's Shoes in the startups today for the millennials that seem to be, and again what Yannick was citing today, research showing they're more inclined to buy from someone that makes a difference than someone that's just making a profit. Yannick's right, the, the problem is, is marketers ruin everything. So, so what's happened is my data shows and what I'm looking at is that the trend has already swung the other direction. You know, Yannick, I don't know what you're, what, how, you, you know, if you look at the data, but like, I think what's happened is there was probably three months there a year ago where every startup, and I look at, you know, seven to 25 startups a week because I invest, 
came in and said, Gary, Gary, I got it. All right, listen, I have an umbrella company. It's an umbrella. And for every umbrella you buy, we give an umbrella to some poor dude in Seattle. <laughs> you know, like, like, and so what happened was when Tom Shoes did it and when a couple of the early people did it, it was novel. It caught our attention. Yes, the younger set does care more about charity and giving and you know, no question they're wired differently. The problem is it became a tactic. Every scum bucket marketer that I know started a startup that had a buy one, get one, give one, da da da, and it became tactical and now there's 8,000 of them out there and now it's just noise. It's the same old game, supply and demand, and so I think there's an opportunity. The problem is, where's the intent? So many people now do it because they think it's the hook for their business to succeed, not because they actually give a fuck about curing a disease or helping somebody in an underprivileged environment. And when your intent is fucked, you lost. And that's real, and you guys know it. And you also know that you've done many things that where your intent was wrong, it was tactical, and it never wins. So if your intent's, what's that? Amen. Amen, brother, thank you. It's true, and so, I think, can somebody tomorrow start a company that's buy and give and win? Absolutely, if it's their truth. A, it's harder to break through because there's so much shit. And B, unfortunately, there's just not so many people that have that truth. Hey Gary, Diana here. How are you? So, I'm great, how are you? Good. So if Snapchat's on this side, yes. I kind of see meditation on this side. Okay. I know you're very kind of futuristic and have made quite a few predictions on the meditation side. Obsessed. I'm, I'm really curious, how do you see meditation playing out as a consumable in the marketplace? Is it events? Is yes. it online? Yes. Everything? Yes. Meditation, meditation is the fitness industry over the last 20 years. That's meditation in 20 years is a foundational pillar in American consumer society. Mental health is the next physical health. You, everybody here in 20 years will have some, there'll be the lightweight version of it, like, oh, there's some cool little app and it just makes me sleep better or escape, and then there'll be more extreme stuff. And the truth is, like, just so everybody knows, and I appreciate you knowing that and people that follow me, I know really nothing about it. I just know consumer behavior and I know when I see the tea leaves, I just know it is going to be, there's a, I'm 100% positive that the next retail explosion, like that looks like SoulCycle, is a, or like Blockbuster video, is gonna be meditate. There is going to be a Starbucks and SoulCycle of meditation. The place that every trendy, rich, cool person goes to and sits there. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, and so think about it, think about it as every other genre that pops. So there'll be the Starbucks and SoulCycle. There'll be the tap out, you know, UFC fighting, there was the merchandise company, there'll be the tap out, or the life is good. There'll be a brand that owns the meditation swag, right? And then there's gonna be all the other things, and so I think it's gonna be big. big. Like, as a matter of fact, you guys heard earlier, the 50 to 75 million dollars, 10 companies, one of them will be a major bet on meditation. I don't know what, but I will, I will, eSports, VR B2B, I think v- virtual reality is being sold as a consumer thing way too early. It feels like internet 91, 92, so I think it's way too early, but much like in 91, 92, the people that made money were like the infrastructure of the internet itself, I'm very hot on virtual reality B2B. I'm very hot on meditation, I'm very hot on eSports, and I'm very hot on fully integrated direct-to-consumer products. Um, so. Um, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, Chris Kaplan. Um, one, uh, you, you, the stump question for you tonight was around your children. So yes. I have a 10-year-old girl who's going on 25 and a 12-year-old boy who I just gave an iPhone 6 to without a data plan, but wants a Snapchat account, has an Instagram account, and your thoughts and ideas yep. on our youth and their just obsession with social media. Yep. I know it's inevitable and I want yep. them to be a part of it because they yep. teach me it'll be a part of it. Yep. But how do I can how do I I don't want to be the helicopter parent either. Yep. How do we control the four thousand fucking passive aggressive assholes out yeah. there who tell my child 
they're, horrible, horrible. Right, they're things. fat or ugly or whatever. Uh, um, so, a couple things. One, I truly believe the way that we always solve every problem is at the religion, not the tactic. Back to the question about fitness. So I think that if you've been able to instill the right pillars into your child, you win. Like, it's unbelievable how much peer pressure wasn't able to penetrate you know, me because of what my parents did in building that self-esteem and things of that nature. Look, this is evolution. Like, you know, when I was a kid, like, Girls that got second phone lines, that was gonna ruin them. Like they were gonna lay in their room and be on the phone all day. Or Zelda was gonna fucking make me like not capable of being a human in society. <laughs> like, you know, whether it was video games or whether it was punk music or rock and roll in the 70s or whether it was Elvis shaking his hips. Like, I mean, what Miley Cyrus did four years ago on the MTV Music Awards that got everybody freaked out is tame on Instagram. Like evolution. And so I think you've got to instill good principles into your kids. It's unbelievable how many parents have come to me and said, I'm not letting my son on Snapchat, right? Because they're sort of sexting because that was the headline for Snapchat. Meanwhile, I'm like, does your son have a phone? Yeah. Does he have the internet on his phone? (laughs) Yes. I'm like, you know he can go to jizzhut.com pretty easily. (laughs) Like, like, so, you know, so I think, I think that, uh, I think that, and I, I promise you, like, that's far more dangerous of what you're scared of than the random 12 year old floozy chick in science class. So, I think, I think that, um, I think it's, I think, it, I think the way you solve everything, by the way, is communication. And I think a lot of parents are scared to have real talk. And so I think you have conversation. I, look, a 10 year old and a 12 year old is still a 10 and 12 year old. You have to be observant. Um, but it's gonna be what it's gonna be, man, right? Like we all, listen, the funny thing is, I don't know if it's because I'm like, so don't wanna die and like stay so grounded to my youth or because I'm in this stuff, like, I'm sure you guys all feel the same way, right? Like, we were just there. Like I was just in sixth grade spending four months trying to figure out how to steal Playboys from 7-Eleven with my buddies. You know, like it was just two minutes ago. So like this, you know, I think we love our kids so much, we go on defense. It's the way people run their business. When something gets good, they go to defense. And that's the second they start losing. And so I understand why and I feel those things too, but it is what it is. Like so, you know conversations and instilling the right things into them, you know? And my big thing actually is more, I'm gonna watch my kids to make sure they're not the kids that are doing the bad stuff to other kids, more so like, I want them to feel the adver- I'm actually okay with getting their feelings hurt and things of that nature, I wanna have those conversations, but like, this obsession with protecting our kids from getting their feelings hurt is a little too far, like, I want Xander to get punched in the fucking mouth. I do, I do. I think it'll be good for him, you know? He's just a rich kid from the Upper East Side. Fuck, he needs a good beating. (laughs) Hey Gary, um, so so often I I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and successful different people and stuff and it's not always, but more often than not, there's a cost, often a, Get kind of a, they're unaware of the cost that the, the, yes. the, that the brand building has created. So while you've been crushing it, and, yes. and, and, and I use that term obviously because yes. your book, and, yes. and with respect, I, I read your book, yes. and uh, I, I kind of hated the book because yes. it, it showed me how to do something I was scared shitless to do yes. in such a simple way. And I'll never forget the day I posted the first video, and thanks for making me look like a total asshole in the world. Because I tell you, I put this video out and it was so bad. <laughs> But I was, I, w- I was so scared and, yeah. and you simplified the whole process for me and, and it's gone on to do different things and, and I'm very grateful for that. But I work with a lot of very interesting people who often have a lot of success. And I was going to say, to be politically correct, that there's, often, sometimes there's not a cost, but the reality is almost every time there is a cost. There's always a cost. And I'm just wondering, and I'm not trying to expose you, but I'm just wondering from your point of view if, if you wouldn't mind sharing a degree of that cost or if, you know, if there is a cost in your point. I mean, the cost is, there's a lot of, so I, I actually, when I really think about your question, the biggest cost I'm worried about is if actually 
I do something wrong. So for the most part, I don't do anything wrong by our standards in society and I'm scared that I've done such a great job of building, to the people that know me, a very good thing that I'm scared of like, what, I always think like, what could slip me up? Like I think about that a lot. As far as, to answer your question directly, what's been the cost? Well, leisure, you know like, it's fun to like do fun stuff and like, I, I don't remember the last time that I was fundamentally completely calm. Like, <laughs> let me explain what I mean. Everything's on me. My whole family, my brother, my two brother-in-laws, my brother, my parents, my sister, everybody's livelihood at this point and lifestyle is on my shoulders. The whole kit and caboodle. Like, that's called pressure. And then, and then, and then if you really like, are wired the way I am, I genuinely care about the people that are in my ecosystem. Even the people that are like, you know, employee 432, I feel pressure. I feel pressure. So the biggest cost, I think, is peace. Like, when, you, when you're the one, you know, like, this whole notion of being the entrepreneur, like, like, I don't know, like, and I see a lot of you shaking your head, you guys know, like, you guys, you gals know, like, it's on you. Like, it's super fun to be number two. Like, I always bust AJ's chops. I'm like, you got the fucking gig. (laughs) Because, like, when the whole thing's on fire, like, you still can go, what are we gonna do? (laughs) (laughs) Right? Like, like, for me, for me, for me, I think the biggest thing I gave up was, like, it's very, and I'm doing it right now, Man, man, it's been, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade, it's been a long time when I didn't recognize that not only my life, but pretty much everybody else I gave a fuck about in the world was predicated on my behavior, period. Like, for real. So, peace of mind and like, like, like that is just, you give that up. Um, and I've given up a ton. I mean, the first five years of my marriage is one of the great regrets of my life. Like, because I was hustling so much, like I easily and should have and desperately wish that I went on two more weeks vacation with Lizzie to Paris and Japan and just ate sushi for a week. Like, and I didn't. And I don't get it back. And so it makes me very conscious of the kids' stuff. And so I've learned from that behavior and I've been much better with the kids. Seven weeks vacation still, I don't even like saying it out loud. You know, like, um, and there's other things. Uh, Friendships. There's a lot of good friends that I have from high school and college that I don't have a relationship with anymore that would have been very fruitful in my life that are just gone. Um, Pressure is tough, man, right? But for me and for a lot of people in here, there's just no other gear. You're just, your destiny's your destiny. So I'm not naive, I don't, I, like, I don't think it's so great being me. I really don't. I, I love being me, but I recognize why me is not great on paper. Like I truly believe that there's a much sweeter spot in our society than the one I sit with. I, I romance it as, the guy or girl that makes like 347 a year as a solid exec, has ridiculous work-life balance, goes to every fucking Little League game, has four weeks, big, like, you know, but I just don't know it that gear. I don't have that. Do you, sorry. Do you think that people like you exist to pull people into the gear or the middle ground? Where I'm they sorry? Can, do, you think, do you think people like you need to exist in the world to pull people into a space where they can have a bit more peace of mind? In other words, that you pay a price for that. And yeah. this is a very personal question because I, I, I'm, like, despite the fact that I'm always in front of people, I'm speaking or whatever, it's very, very extremely lonely to do what I do. It's the loneliest. Yeah. Dude, there's nobody else. Like, if you were truly, truly the number one of your thing, there's just, what else? Like who, where? Like, I, I talk to no, do you know that I never talk to my wife about work? Goose egg. And I think that the people in here that have that same thing, they realize, what am I gonna talk about? 99% of my day is fires. My, I'm in the business of eating shit. <laughs> like, 
do I really want to come home and tell my wife that, like, like, I don't celebrate victory. Like, the biggest vulnerability, one of the weakest things, one of the things that I'm doing worst in my company is we are killing it and we don't celebrate dick. Like, we win a count, like, yeah. Like, like we don't even talk, like, like, I'm, like, I don't know. I, all I do, all my energy is spent on the negative. It's what I do. It's what you have to do. Because if you don't address it, it becomes cancer and becomes your vulnerability. And so, I get it, brother. I think there's a huge price to pay. You know? A huge price to pay. But, uh, but I would not have it any other way. I'm happy as shit. Because I'm living the game that I was built for. But when, this is why I'm so scared of the reverse. I'm scared of the people. The cliche thing is everybody right now at Princeton who five to seven years ago would have went to Bain and McKinsey, made a lot of money, met another attractive smart person at Bain and McKinsey, married them, bought a second home in the Hamptons because they one made 740 at fucking Goldman and one made 297 at this. That same fucking person today is starting a startup and has the Uber for maids. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and is gonna lose is gonna lose, is gonna take a three to six year setback, is gonna lose equity in their ecosystem, is gonna have a bruised confidence because they weren't, bi- I'm, as an entrepreneur, as a one, I only wanna lose. Like, losing is comfortable. Losing is delicious. That's why I love being a Jets fan. You know, like, <laughs> like so, so I'm worried actually, it's so funny who I'm trying to talk to these days is the people that aren't built for what you and I know. Because it's super glamorous. Like, this is why I'm visceral to what's going on on Instagram and you've been hearing me talk about the bullshit entrepreneurs who rent, rent, watches, planes, girls, baby giraffes, (laughs) and then sell people on how they got it because they allude to they having it versus renting it and then selling bullshit and, and, and they're selling entrepreneurship. That, does, that is not what entrepreneurship is. It's just not. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. I think we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Hi, Gary. I'm hey, Steve. I'm a behavioral profiler. Um, <laughs> I don't want to ask a question as much as I want to make a statement. Okay. Um, we need you just the way you are. Now, I know there's a lot of questions probably in some people's heads in here about your style, the way you do things, but you're basically created this way, and there's people in this world that wouldn't do shit if it wasn't for people like you. And so I just want to encourage you in the fact that, you know, you're thinking about your fatherhood and your husbandry and all these different things, but they hooked up with you being the way you are. I get it, man. And that's you, and I want you to be proud of it. I am. And I know that. But I just want to say that for everybody else. And listen. But this is who you are. You're like a modern day prophet for the business world. And Elon Musk is another one. I mean, there's, you're an anomaly. You're not normal. And listen. No, okay? Listen. And and I say that because there are social norms. I get and it. You're so far outside of the social norm that you stand out, you become an anomaly, and everybody's freaked out at it. But it's who you are, it's what you are, and stay being that. You know, my man, I think you'll find this interesting based on, on what you do. I'm so in tune to that that I've had very intense conversations with my wife, which is people not having self-awareness or being blind to it. I know that the way I'm wired is the cliche thing where there's that person that's super famous and they die and then like the country mourns and then the family goes, yeah, but they weren't there for me. Like I'm so conscious of that. I'm so aware that I'm for scale that I know it comes at the cost of those 10 people, that I hack at it a lot because I'm trying to figure out like, boy, do I 
No. And it's, and it's a crazy feeling to know it. Like, it's a crazy feeling to hear thanks for put, like, I don't know. Like, you know what else, by the way? It's super easy for me not to get caught up in it. Like, I didn't do anything. My mom and dad had sex at the right second. Like, like I, I didn't do anything. Like, this is who I am. Like, this has always been who I was. Even It's so fun for me to have my grammar school and middle school friends pop up because of Facebook. They, they're telling me shit that I long forgot, and it's just the same shit. Like, there's something about the way that I communicate that makes people see it slightly different and then allows them to do something with it. And so, I'm not running from it. I just, I would, if I can do anything to hack not doing the cliche thing that happens to people like me, which is the people closest to me lose the most, the people furthest away from me win the most, I'd like to at least do that. But other than that, I just don't even know how not to be me. Well, thank you. (laughs) So to that end, um, Melissa Lanz of The Fresh 20, um, to that end, a little nervous to ask this question in a room full of HD men, but um, so do you think that there's room for women, like what's your prediction on women changing that dynamic and going from the crush it economy to the live it economy and kind of changing the dynamic of what it means to be a successful entrepreneur? Do you think that women are going to make that make that change in, in business or So let's, let's break important? it down a little further. I want to make sure I understand it. So um, when... Give me a little more detail. So, for most of the highly successful women entrepreneurs that yes. I know, they're less of like they're not concerned about crushing it. They're they're concerned about um, like living a, a holistic a holistic life. So that you mean d- with children? Like no, go, not, go in no, details. not even children. Just having a little bit more of a of a balance, being more connected to the people on the ground, to their friends, to their family, like living in a way that look, think, they don't have to make yeah. the sacrifices that you're making. Yeah. Look, I mean. 99% of the dudes don't want to do what I'm doing either. Like, there's like, so I, so look, couple things. One, boys and girls are different. Like, it's just In what real. way? <laughs> yeah. And like, and so like, you know, this has been a very interesting topic. VaynerMedia was built on female leadership. I was, you know, I wrote the first check into Birchbox after they had 50 no's. Like, I've been very, very, I have a higher percentage of female entrepreneurs in my ecosystem and I get all this credit and I feel terrible about it because the reason I've done these things is I'm actually prejudiced against dudes in a world where I think EQ, in a world where it has been proven that EQ is not more favorable to a woman, I'm being prejudiced to guys that they can't be as EQ oriented as women even though I am. Um, so what do I, I, I think it's super, so first of all, look how far we've come in America on race and gender in 30, 40, 50 years. It's really good and there'll be more and I think that it's really cool and I, you know, when it comes to business, it's so sports for me that you would be, like it's stunning to me how I cannot even wrap my head around even thinking of anything other than the market. You know, like, like I never would think like, oh, you're a Hispanic. Oh, you're a transgender. Oh, you're a black dude. You're a girl. Like, I would never think that, like, I don't care. Can we win? Like, can, we, can you fucking sell shit? Like, and, and so I think that, um, one, I think a lot about if I was exactly my way as a woman, how much would starting a family pull at me? from a chemical, we're different game. I'm fascinated by that, just like in general. Um, but I think that, um, I, think, I think a lot of white males really, really, really worry about what other people think of them and they have it best. So I'm very empathetic to what a woman's gonna think about what everybody else thinks about them. And I think that's holding people back boy, girl, black, white, more than anything in the world. And so I do think, um, I think that's the key to the question that you're asking. Once a person is capable of really getting into a place where they're content with themselves and can, at a very high level, not worry about the market's feedback to themselves, they can win in whatever they want. And so living it, first and foremost, is defined super different by every person. Um, and so that's just how I see it. 
But it's funny, it's really an interesting issue. It's a really interesting genre for me. My daughter is much more similar to me than my son is. I can tell that already. And so like, I want her to be, fuck, if she wants to, I want her to be number one. And I don't want anything to stop her. But I also am pretty interesting about this, and I say this to my minority and female entrepreneurs. If one person, one, if one person in the world that looks like you ever achieved it, then you can too. Gary, you talked quite a bit today about self-awareness. Um, how do you build and sustain self-awareness? I don't know. I, I hate this question because fuck, I really want to give a good answer and there's people that do different things that feel like, I don't feel like I have a grasp on how to teach self-awareness or maintain it. I know I have it, I know I rely on it, I know that there's people, that I've seen people talk about how to do it, like I respect that that may be true, I've never dug under the hood or watched somebody do it. I have, I have seen this, and this is something for a lot of you that are building things to think about. I have seen a lot of my people grow in their self-awareness out of the safety that I've created in the environment, in the culture of the company. And so within safety, they've been able to expand their emotional intelligence. Um, but I don't know, man, but boy, let me tell you something. For that gentleman or whoever, about, like, if you know how to do it, if, you, if, if there's a way to really do it, it's the drug. It is the game. It's unbelievable how powerful it is if you have it. It just saves you, it makes you likable, it makes you like yourself, it makes you understand shit. The, the, the other thing, you, know, you understand, there's something that comes along with it. There's a cousin of all these feelings. Empathy is something I live on. Do you know that nobody's ever let me down? Did, did, if, you, like, if you really understood why I'm so damn happy, <laughs> and I really am, it's because nobody's ever let me down because I actually have zero expectation of others. Like zero, because I understand. I get it. I'm empathetic. I understand. I get it. Like, you couldn't, you shouldn't. You weren't raised that way, you didn't see it. You didn't, like, I don't know. And so, um, I'm not sure, but I can tell you this. If, if I could wish, besides health, on my children, two things, it would be, unbelievable self-esteem, which I do think I can control, and then I, I wish it was unbelievable self-awareness, which I don't, I don't understand that I can control as much. Hey, hey Gary. How are you? Great, I'm gonna take this opportunity to get some free life coaching, so thank you in advance. <laughs> uh, I founded a successful company, and if I keep doing it for a few more years, I'll have hit my number and I'll be done. Right. Uh, the problem is I have this burning desire to be on the Snapchat and like giving advice and helping young people and all that, yes. but I don't have the type of business where that would like feed into leads or anything like that, so it's a big yes. dilemma for me. Do I start doing that now, or do I keep uh, grinding and try to like hit this financial thing? And my girlfriend asked me last night, she's like, well, if you died, what would you be happier about having that dollar in the bank account or having your book published and helped a lot of young people? And I was like, oh, fuck. So I seems just wanted like, to throw it out. And seems see like you found the right girl. Um, I, think, uh, I, think, uh, I think my answer to that is you should do both. I don't, like what I would do if I were you and what I normally do in these situations is I would audit the rest of it. So like, so like, let's get real, to, you willing to get very real with me? Let's do it. How many hours do you work a day? For real, don't bullshit me. Six. Do both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, because eight is a fucking half day, and that means you, <laughs> and, and that means that you have two hours to do all that good, and that's fucking awesome, really. You know what's funny? I want what you want too. I, it's what I do so much. Unfortunately for me, like that's what costs me 16 hours. You know what I mean? So that you should, I mean, if you, if you truly, if you want to shoot it black and white straight, you should do both. You should figure out how to get to eight. Hopefully it doesn't take time out of time together. Hopefully it's coming out of, I don't know what the fuck you're doing with your other <laughs> fucking <laughs> house of cards, surfing. I don't know what the fuck you're doing, but like, like two hours a day you can find to give advice and do that stuff and it's, it, is, it, it is, you know, it's so funny, like doing that, doing the whole personal brand thing and being out there 
it's such a double win. Like, depending on how much vanity and, and like that kind of stuff you have in, it gets to scratch that. I mean, I was waiting for my car today in LA. Some dude was flying down the highway, almost died, pulled over, was like, Gary me, just left. Like, that's the biggest high ever. <laughs> I was so pumped. And then on the other hand, the, far, the other, and it's an equal, I don't think it's better or worse for me. I mean, we're all wired different. The emails of people who are like, hey man, you really helped me. Like I was signing up for all this crap. I did this, this happened. You know, it's so, um, it's, in, it's intoxicating for people to email you and say that you changed their life. I have that happen every day now. It's crazy, you know? Man. It's crazy. So if you feel like, if you're feeling a yearning towards it, you should do it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, man. Gary, you talked about fires and fighting fires, and I think that's a battle that probably all of us do on a daily basis, right? So yes. what I, I have a two-part question. One is, what do you fuck up on often? Yes. And when you lose, how do you not lose a lesson? How do I not lose a lesson? So I love losing and I hate losing, right? They're like polar opposites. So the thing I most fuck up on is that I think I can do everything. I have big eyes. You know, fat kid cake, right? Like, I just have big eyes. I just... Because I work so much and I work so hard and so intense, I always think that I can pull it off. So sometimes I'm just trying to do 78 things and you can't. That's my common mistake. I'll always do that. It's because somewhere deep down I still think it's working out because I think it's a net net game. But it is where I fall short um, on more than a, mac, a micro level, probably on a, a three fourths micro all the way up to macro. For me, I never, I mean, I don't know if it's the same reason that I remember everything that's ever happened. Like, I remember everything. Like, I remember Flowtown. Like, like, you know, like, I remember everything. Like, just fucking everything. And so, I, um, because of that, I guess, I don't lose the lessons because I could never, ever understand why someone would knowingly make the same mistake twice. Um, so, yeah. I wanted to ask you a question back. You were talking about self-awareness. Yes. And where do you get most of your self-awareness? Is this one of the things that you feel like you've had or, yes. or is it life lessons? Is it really the shit, like the, the, the hard moments? Um, can you give some examples of where you've had some uh, I think it started, big awakenings, yeah. I guess, I, right? Yeah, you know what? So I realized somewhere around sophomore year of high school that suddenly way more people than I wanted found me annoying. <laughs> that was probably the first time I was like, maybe I was losing my, like, I remember that. I remember early high school being like, wait a minute, they're not highly entertained and finding this interesting? Um, so I do remember, I, I think it's DNA. Yeah. I don't know where I get it, I don't, but I, when you said let, like, I do remember from 12 to 18, it, I found my way how to make this more palpable and I thought I really owned it and got great in it until I became more of a public figure and every time a fucking piece of content on Facebook goes viral, 4,000 people say I'm a dick face. Right. So, you know, I think, that, I think that I try to deploy self-awareness as much as possible and now, I'm self-aware that 20% of people on First Impact are not gonna <laughs> like it. Right. Um, and so I do think it came from the lessons of life. Like, I, I think one of the things that one has to do is accept themselves, right? right? And I think once, I'm, once I did that, then it didn't hurt so much to have 20 per, two out of 10 people not like it. Um, because the cool thing with me is I also have three out of 10 people that like it so much and think it's the coolest thing they've ever seen and you just play it out. And then for me, because I know I'm grounded in very good truths and principles, I get a second at bat at it, which is it's so rewarding for people that thought you were a douchebag to turn and become an advocate. I would tell you probably the 50 biggest advocates I have on social initially hated me. Okay, so was there, a, you know, a lot of people are in fear yes. of being authentic, right? Yes. They, they don't even know necessarily who they are or even the unknown unknowns about their own personality. No, that's a really good point. That's right. Right, okay. 
And so, but you just, you have always had that. What would you, what advice would you I just tell give? people that they're gonna die. You're gonna die. Right, you're gonna die, right? So just you're gonna die, okay. and at 91, when you're sitting there, you're like, you know what? Fuck. <laughs> I mean it. One of the, this is interesting to me. This is where, this is where hard wiring is something I believe in tremendously. It took me, again, when this started all happening in my 20s and 30s and 40s, and I've started realizing this. Boy, did I fucking, was I attracted to old people as a kid. Like one of, I don't know if any of you did this, and, and then maybe we have some connections that way. I was weird as shit. Like, I, like, like my friend, we'd be, like, I, I grew up in the 80s when, which meant you played outside, right? And so when we were outside playing, grandparents would visit once in a while, and maybe because I didn't have, my, both my grandparents, three of my four grandparents died before I was born. People died young in Russia because they didn't want to fucking live. Um, uh, and, so, and so maybe that's why, but, and I used to think that's why, but now I just realize, I mean, I learned a lot from just talking to old people, and I think I picked that up at, like, I, you know what I smelled? Regret. And I'm gonna tell you something. As scary as it is for you to judge me and for you to not think I'm cool and this and that, what's way scarier, the thing I, I think one of the scariest things in the world is regret. You know why? You can't fix it. I can fix you thinking I'm a dick face over time. I can't fix being 96 and becoming 64 again. And so I think I'm so visceral to the regret that I smelled on old people as a kid that it impacted me heavily. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tanya. Hey, Tanya. Uh, work with teen entrepreneurs, have four of them here, and I was just wondering if you could give them a piece of advice um, as kids that are in high school, 15, yep. 16 years old, that are running successful companies, trying to balance you know, everything in life. Yep. Um, any piece of advice that you may have for them? Yes, kids, don't listen to Tanya. <laughs> Don't listen to your parents. Definitely don't listen to your fucking teachers. Don't listen to me. Listen to yourself. And I fucking mean that. You'll learn, if you're wrong, you'll learn. And it's much better to learn by tasting it than reading about it or being told about it. That's my advice, Tony. You got it. That's, and by the way, that's advice to entrepreneurs, right? Like that's what you, like, that's not advice to operators who are gonna be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. They've gotta listen to parents. They've gotta like, they're gonna play that game. But if you're an entrepreneur, there's, it's binary. You've gotta come, go completely the other way because the market's the judge. And it's back to what you and I talked about. When you're the entrepreneur, it's lonely. You know, mom's not there to save you. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker and a Jets fan, so. I love you already. Jets. <laughs> I also love um, your hair. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think you kind of sort of answered sort of what I was going to say. I'm kind of new to not giving a fuck. Okay. It's a new thing for me. Yep. It's kind of happened. Like, but has it always been there? Yeah. It's always been there, right? Yes. I was like always nice to people. But you're like, you know what? Let this go up. Yeah, I've just kind of I'm let. nice to people. No, no, no. <laughs> I know, but I also, I feel less responsible for people's feelings. Let me tell you something real quick, and some of you know this. I'm only razzy on stage when I'm not talking to anybody individually. I'm actually very uncomfortable with confrontation on a one-to-one -one level, and I would never, ever think about hurting somebody's feelings. For, I mean, why? Yeah. You know, so. I'm it's, with you. You know, it's just when so, I'm more visceral when somebody else is doing something to some. I'm more of like, he's being mean to him and I'll, that's when I'll jump in, yeah. you know? Yes, and I, I don't mean just being mean. I get it. Although I have no problem with confrontation whatsoever. Um, I, I'm a lawyer, so it kind of, and a New Yorker. But you know so what, I apologize. <laughs> my, I would actually argue my biggest weakness ever was my lack, my visceral reaction to confrontation, which made me very bad at firing for about 10 to 12 years because I was terrible at it. Like I was terrible at it. I was so full of shit. Like I would never give any critical feedback 
and then you just walk in and be fired because I got pent up enough courage to finally do it. I was terrible at it. And, it, and I, I was really bad at it and it's something I'm very embarrassed of. And the worst version of it is it's how I broke up with girls and I hate to say it out loud because I wanna be really, like it was, it's the single thing I'm most embarrassed of of the way I broke up with girls that I dated because I wasn't a man enough to break up to their face. That felt Whoa. good. <laughs> Good to get the po- it's good to get the poison out. <laughs> All right, go ahead. We, we forgive you. Thank you. <laughs> so my question really is like, what's the ROI on like not giving a fuck and being unapologetically yourself? Because that's Speed. kind of where I'm at. Okay. Speed. Speed. The thing that you, when you're not spending any time worrying, you're spending time on executing. Speed. And I, and I like the way a lot of you reacted to that because that's a weird answer to that question. But I can see that a lot of you caught it and some of you understand it and do it. Speed is the game in what we all do for a living. And if you're not worried about dwelling on what people think, you're in execution mode. And I do everything in my possession, everything in my power, excuse me, to put myself in full execution mode at all times. Awesome, thank you. You got it. All right, now I have to go. I love you guys. That is it for this episode, ladies and gentlemen. If you enjoyed it, nothing would make me happier than hearing your thoughts or your biggest takeaways. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Jason Gaynar, J-A-Y-S-O-N-G-A-I-G-N-A-R-D, or email me at Jason, J-A-Y-S-O-N, at communitymade.com. For show notes and any resources mentioned in this episode, simply visit Community Made the group. If you're not a member, it's free. Simply visit communitymade.com to get access. If you enjoyed this podcast, I would be forever grateful if you got the word out by sharing it with a friend, rating it on iTunes, or leaving a review. Next season, we'll be showcasing a reviewer at the end of every single episode. So to be considered, simply leave an honest review on iTunes. I appreciate your love and support. Look forward to having you on the next episode where I share my most my most cherished interview, a conversation I had with my good friend Jordan, who scaled his business while fighting stage three melanoma cancer. I'm totally okay with cancer. I'm, I'm, I'm the happiest person with cancer in the world. It's made me really love my family. It's really, really made me appreciate my, my kids and waking up every single day and seeing the sun and, and seeing the mountains and seeing everything and just appreciating that has been phenomenal. I am so grateful that Jordan invested the time to sit down with me for that interview because unfortunately, he ended up passing away a few weeks after the recording, leaving his wife and his two beautiful kids behind. And it's it's just filled with so much wisdom. You, you really don't want to miss it. So I will see you on episode five. Bye.